So um, this is a second career from here, so I'm going to take you all the way back. My parents are Indian, and I grew up in Brazil, which explains why I look the way I do, but I don't act the way you expect me to. <laughs> Uh, I came to the U.S. for college. I had a, a bachelor's in math and computer science, a master's in computer science, and I worked in IT for a very long time. Ron heard all of this before many times. Um, and then eventually what happened is I started doing a lot of stuff with PTAs, with a uh, couple nonprofits, stuff with the community, and I felt that that was a much better fit with the person I became. And my last corporate job, I was the director for the inventory systems for Gap Inc. And if the, my systems didn't work, all the systems under my, 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 my department didn't work, uh, no clothes went to any of the Gap, Banana Republic, or, or Old Navy stores in the entire world. So it was a very demanding, high visibility job. Everybody in the company knew who I was. But the best thing I did was get changed to the store on time. You know, and I just did not think that that was the best use of my skills and talents because I was so much more excited about the work I was doing in the community. So I would have this really demanding job and work 10, 12 hours a day and stay up all night doing my volunteer stuff. So I go, this is insane, so I need to find something that I will be happy with, that I will do during the day. I don't care if I work 12 hours a day, but it has to be something that I will be proud of doing. So I went in search of what I wanted, I could do. I wanted it to be a people business because I love people. I wanted to be in the community. Um, I wanted to hire people. This was 2009, so it was a little bit of a slump, and I figured I might as well hire, you know, create jobs um, where people are needing them right now. And I wanted to manage people because I like to do that. I went through a franchise broker. This is a franchise, and that's how I landed here. I love what I do today. Uh, we started small. Well, small, there was nothing. No clients, no caregivers, no, no staff. Today, we, I have five people in the office, about 100 caregivers out in the field. So what I wanted to talk about today is, is what's happened in the last couple of years is that we've become licensed. So this changes the, the, how people hire caregivers uh, a lot. Um, it's also changed how we work a lot. So I was going to give a little bit of a background on what home care is first so that you can understand where is it that you're going to see a friend that's trying to hire somebody and you're going to stop and say, this isn't the way that you're going to be safe, this is how you should do it instead. Okay? Stop me anytime if you have questions. All right, so, oh, first of all, I'm going to see all of you all at Bacon and Brew. I'm working 12 days, all day. So, <laughs> so, uh, I am actually, I'm on the board of directors and I am um, everywhere. You know, I have a job that's just taking, you guys are not taking the tokens, right? You're actually taking oh, cash. Yeah. Yeah. Cash only, no tokens. Cash only. Cash well, maybe I'll come tokens. to you guys before 11 o'clock so you can give me a drink because I'm going to be doing tokens and collecting tokens and counting tokens. So I'll be in all the other beverage booths. You need a plug in here to warm up. I need to. And I'll be there at 9. And I'm so much happy with you. You will be there before it opens. So I'll stop by and say hi. Um, I will also be at Ron's uh, breakfast. Uh, there and I was actually one of the award winners last year. And am I speaking this year? You're going to give an award. I'm going to give an award this year. <laughs> so I get around. I'm going to be seeing any, any of you who don't know me will see me again. Cool. <laughs> All right. So, um, so home care. What we do is we enable elderly to age in place in their homes if that's what they choose to do. Um, we help them with a variety of things, and those are the things we call ADLs and IADLs. And I, I use the word because I want you guys to remember that a lot of people have long-term care insurance that pays for things like home care, but they only pay if they need help with these things. All the other stuff that we do, the long-term care insurance doesn't look at. So eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, and maintaining continence. So these are the things that our long-term care insurance is going to look at and, and, and able in order for them to actually pay benefits out to the people who have it. How many people here have long-term care insurance? I have about probably a third of my clients that their services are fully paid by long-term care. And what I find is the people that don't have it don't necessarily want to sign up for the help they need. But the people who have it go for it because they have it. So it will make it easier on your families later on if you have it. Anybody here sell insurance? I'm going to do your job for you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. You have long-term care. We, we, we shut it down. You we don't it sell it. Down. All right. Well, yeah. State Farm shut it down. They used to be. Ivy? Ivy has it. New York Life. There Ivy we go. Has it. Nice. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. My son worked for New York Life last year. Briefly. Yes. 
All right, so the IADLs are the other things that we do that long-term care doesn't, doesn't care about, but the people who we help and the families do. Uh, we do some housework, we, we prepare their meals a lot of times they're not eating. We take him to wherever they need to go, grocery store, to doctors, out to see a friend. You know, we do that, things like that. Uh, medication reminders and also exercise. We take, go for a walk around the block, make sure that they're doing their physical therapy exercises, some stretching, whatever they, they need. All right, this is the list of the things that we do. So it includes all the things I talked about in the, the previous two slides. And when we talk to different families, we actually go through this whole list. No two plan of cares are the same because everybody needs a little something a little different. Um, I know that's really tiny. I mean, I can send it to you guys later if you want it. All right, so we usually work in the home, but we also will work in assisted living facilities. Um, the transportation, so I'm gonna stop right there. Uh, what happens is people move to a, a facility and they think they don't need any help, but they're not getting one-on-one -on -one care there. So we end up being signed on a lot of times for people who are living in a community because they need a little bit more. If they're a fall risk, they're a fall risk. You know, even if they're there, they get up in the middle of the night, they don't necessarily press the button to ask for somebody to come help them, or they're not going to wait for how long it, it, it takes. So we're all in the room helping already. And also we take people out, all that stuff. <coughs> anyway, all right, so why people choose home care? They choose that because it is, if they don't need 24-7, and I got to tell you, if they need 24-7, it's cheaper to move. 24-7 yeah. is really expensive at home. Um, it has gotten more, it, it's almost tripled in the last three years based on all different kinds of laws that kind of happen. Like how much would it be? Um, right now we charge 630 a day. And as of January, when, when the minimum wage goes up in San Mateo, it's going to go up because it's based on um, what we have to pay the caregivers. That's what's happened is we have to pay the caregivers two and a half times what we used to have to pay them a couple years ago and the, 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 the cost gets passed on. Mm -hmm. All right, so it is usually cheaper if you only, I have many clients who only need a couple of visits of three, four hours a week. That's pretty, pretty cheap. Now moving to a facility, you're paying for, you know, 24-7 there. You're paying for everything. You don't get to pick what times you need help. You're just signing up for the whole thing. Um, uh, and a lot of people want to stay in their home. They don't want to move. They, they have all their stuff, all their memories, and that is their choice. So we help them age in place if that's what they need to do. Um, they are getting a one-on-one -on -one person who is creating a personal relationship with them, who is there just for them. Um, what do you want to do right now? What do you want to eat? Let's, what kind of project do you want to work on? Is there, even if it is a, an arts and crafts kind of thing they want to do, let's go through your photo albums and reorganize everything. But you're getting one person who's there dedicated for you. You don't get that if you move, you know, you just don't. Um, and it is very flexible. You can have somebody there three hours, once a week, you can have somebody there 24 seven, you can have them while the adult children are at work, you know, whatever it is that works. Um, with home care, you can have that choice. I'm just going through and I know I'm hitting most bullets without looking at the bullets. Um, we do hourly, some people only want help in the morning, uh, just to get up, get out of bed, get cleaned up, get breakfast, make sure you know what's happening, you know what's happening the rest of the day. And then if there's an issue, we can call the family and say, hey, I think maybe you need to come and see him out today. But um, morning is, uh, is our most popular time for people to ask for help. Um, we do 12 hours, often those are the overnight hours. You know, they get up in the middle of the night, and in the middle of the night they're kind of wobbly and they fall. So that's a very dangerous time, especially right after a hospital stay. Um, and there's a 24 hour. Respite is when we are not there, you're I'm not a regular client. We have people who say, I'm going to a wedding, can you come in and take care of my mom? Like, she can't make the trip, but I can't leave her alone. So we'll come in just so that we can, we may never ever work with them again, but we'll come and do that so that the family can have that special time. All right, so this is this is the meat of it. This is what I really wanted to talk about, and I forgot that I had handouts. All right, so home care was not licensed in California until now. Um, so home care was not licensed in California. So that was kind of really scary because what anybody could decide to be a home care agency and not pay payroll taxes, not carry insurance, not carry workers' comp, um, and not do background checks. So all of that was possible until this year. 
There it is, until now. So we are licensed as of July 1st of this year, and anybody that is doing home care should be licensed right now. Um, is, is there a way, because uh, there is a, a place, a site that you can check if an agency that you or a friend is looking at is licensed. Um, I'd love to send that link out. Mike, can I send, send it to Jake? Send it to Jake, okay. Um, and then send it out to you guys, because I want you to have that as a resource so if somebody says, I'm looking at these three agencies, you can help them by looking and see if those three agencies are licensed. Because if they're licensed, they shouldn't be working with them. Okay. Um, and you can do that also for the caregivers. You can check on the caregivers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody should have a, a number. Thank you. <coughs> All right. So I think I'm going to go to the next page. All right. So for us, and this is a long list of things. No, we're pretty organized, so this wasn't that difficult because we had most of it, we just had to put it together. We had to, um, we had to have bylaws, and, and that sounds simple, I had them. Because I have an attorney who helped me get incorporated, a lot of the agencies didn't have it because they would just fly by night, it's okay, well, I'm gonna start servicing people and they never you know, did what they needed to do to get started. Um, we had to describe what everybody in my office was doing. I had to um, explain how we, um, how we report abuse because um, abuse is, is one of the concerns with the elderly, financial, physical, psychological, neglect, any of those. Um, so we had to explain what is it that we do when, when um, we notice something. And we have definitely reported, we have had people removed from their home um, because we knew that the family was doing something. Um, how we hire people. And um, now there's training every year. There's training for the caregivers, five hours first year, then three, actually it's five hours every year. So we had to explain how we were going to keep that up and how we were going to keep track of it. We had to show what the law book was going to be like. Um, and just um, talk about that already. And insurance and workers comp and license. So these things. This sounds simple to me because I had most of that stuff already, but a lot of the agencies didn't. And there were a lot of agencies who's are, who've already dropped out because this was overwhelming you know, to do this. So there was a few at the end of last year, they said, I'm not going to do this, you know, so they left. Um, now, what is interesting about California, this is not the case, because I just came back from a national conference, and they said they don't have to do this, because the biggest pain for us was having to put our existing 120 caregivers, who are now not 120 anymore, um, through a process where they had to get background checked all the way back to when they were 18. When we used to do it before, we were only allowed to do a background check that took them back to seven years ago. Now that the state's mandating it, and they have their own, they're going all the way to when they were 18, and if there is a misdemeanor anywhere on their past, there's now an exemption process. And that exemption process, you gotta find court documentation as to what happened and how you re remedied it. And uh, you have to get three letters of reference, you have to. So it, it, is, it is, is so complicated that several people say, I'm not doing this. I'll go work at Target instead. I don't wanna deal with this. And I even had people who said, um, that was a very, they're like 60 years old. They said, when I was 20, I did something stupid and I don't want to relive it, so good luck. You know, so they decided not to go through the process. So every agency right now, if, if you talk to anybody in this industry, there is a caregiver shortage because we lost about a third of our caregivers through this process because they could not go through the process that the state asked them to go through or they were unwilling to go through it. And at the same time, the population that needs us is growing. It all happened at the same time. So every agency is currently having issues with, with staff. All right, but they'll be, they have to register with the state. So they will be on a different website than the one for, there's the company website and the one for caregivers. So they're all gonna be here. Um, and they have to, we have just talked about the background check. Um, and they do need to be W-2 employees. All of my caregivers were already W-2 employees before, um, but that was not the case with, with some other agencies. They are no longer able to call themselves home care agencies. To be called yourself a home care agency, you have to hire, you have to do all the things that I did and hire everybody as an employee. Um, they are still in business, but they no longer can say I'm a home care agency. They are like a registry of caregivers and things like that. But, but And they don't necessarily have to go through the same rules we do. So that's something else that you need to know for the people in your life who are looking for caregiving, is that if they don't, if they don't have, thank you, um, uh, an HCO number, they've not gone through this process, their caregivers are not necessarily vetted. 
They have not necessarily gone through the background check and all of that. All right, uh, CV testing, and then we talked about the training. Um, and if they think they have anything on their record, there's a, well, they have to submit the criminal record statement whether they have something or not. But if they do have something, what they put on that statement has to match whatever the state finds. And if not, then there's another process we have to go through. So it, it, it is complicated. It's been it, the first six months of this year. It's all we did, you know, because we had so many people to, to to take it through. And if we let just the caregivers go through the process, it, it wasn't happening. So I ended up, you know, my son who was working at work at New York Life before, when it got to about May and July was looming, and we were not where we wanted to be to finish. I said, okay, you're not working right now. I need you full time. He'd been working with me since he was 16, so he knew the systems. I said, just. Do it. This is what you're going to focus on. You're going to drive to people's homes and take forms. You're going to drive them to get their fingerprinting done. You're going to bring them to the office. You're going to go get another laptop so they can do the training. And he got us through the process that way. It was it was a lot. And because we're a busy office to start out with, we couldn't do it without bringing somebody else in to do that. Um, Sally, yeah. Are you going to talk about the risks of not hiring somebody? from an organization like you? Because I have a lot of clients and um, families let me talk see. about just hiring. You know, people not off the street. Okay, great. Because I want to hear. Isn't he good? Right, right. It's it my next slide. Come on. I know. I know. That's good. Okay. So we do not recommend. If you have somebody that says I found a, somebody on Craigslist from from church, my neighbor. Here's the reason why you shouldn't do it. Somebody has to pay those taxes. If they're not, they're not. Doing, it's not legal, right? They have to pay taxes. Um, if something happens, caregiving is is very accident prone because you're actually helping people physically. So if you get hurt. Workers' comp for, for us is pretty high. Ours less because we don't have that many incidents. But if it, something happens in a family's home, they even either have to have insurance or they, they're going to have to pay some pretty serious medical bills if something happens. Um, homeowner's insurance covers something, but there's a deductible and all that. All right. Um, unemployment insurance. Uh, we have lots and lots of these because our clients come and go. You know, it's the nature of my business. And then when an, uh, if, if a caregiver files for unemployment, it's a valid claim, and that would be the same with the family. Uh, background checks is the big one, right? You know, they have to do a thorough background check. I would suggest if they're going to hire somebody at home, they have to do all the payroll stuff, they have to make sure they have insurance, make them go through the state process. An, an independent caregiver can go through the state process where they have to go through that whole, you know, the background checks and fill out all the forms <coughs> and all that too. Um, and comply with all the labor laws, yes. Related to this, how many people in your estimate are uh, certified and how many are doing independent? No idea. No, no, okay. no. There's a lot of people get this. Their neighbor's just doing something for them. The little lady from church is doing something for them. Tons of people who are doing A lot of people are family caregivers as well. Do they have to be legal citizens? To work for me, yes, because you know. I mean, but, uh, by the law, do they have to be legal or do they have to be. Uh... Good question. I know that we always check. I don't think I don't think that's part of the state check. But I'm sure that they it's somewhere along the way when they're doing their background check, they're checking if they're legal to work in the United States. I mean, they go through FBI, DOJ. It's got to go in there. Yeah. But that's could I, could I mean with the criminal background background checks, they only check the United States. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. You know that um, now? So all the labor laws. So so I joke that um, all I do all the time is try not to get sued. Because we have such a large, you know, pool of caregivers and they come and go, and there's so many laws that changed in the last couple of years, I'm on top of everything. Other people in the industry call me to say, hey, can I do this? And I'll tell them they can, because I, I do not want to get sued, right? So I, I've learned all the laws, I know how to apply everything, and I will help anybody who asks me, um, including my competitors. Let's see, see what else I have in here. Again, not recommended. And the other thing is, is the logistics. You're going to be an agency of one. Everything I have to do that I have staff to do, a family now has to do for themselves. Um, what if they cancel? What if they're sick? Um, then you kind, of, you kind of have nobody, right? If somebody cancels with, with an agency, then we provide a replacement. And I hired my staff in the office, three out of five of us in the office are past full-time caregivers. So I have to the way that they either find a replacement if care is needed or my staff goes out and does it you know so if i promise care they get care even everybody who's on call is somebody from my staff that cannot go out and do care and if there's an issue with how they perform their duties then we can go through that maybe replace the caregiver maybe coach uh, or they steal 
that's the insurance, and we talked about unemployment. <coughs> I, I went to touch on the 24-hour shift. Somebody was asking me how much that was, because what has changed is there used to be an exemption. Caregivers didn't have to be paid for every hour they're working. There were several things that happened that made it go from 290, which is what I used to, 280 that I charged three years ago, to 630 now. And my margins are less because I'm trying not to charge more, but it's just ridiculous. So this is the minimum a caregiver needs to be paid. So even if they're working privately to comply with labor laws, this is the minimum they have to be paid. Ten hours, ten dollars an hour for the first nine hours, and then for the rest of the 15 hours they have to be paid a time and a half. So 315 is the minimum a caregiver has to be paid for a 24-hour shift, even if they're working privately for a client. Otherwise. Now, now what, what about the, if they're staying there 24 hours, they still have to have breaks and everything else according to the law? There is an exemption for that for caregivers because they are there to keep somebody safe. Right. So it is assumed that they are not actually working 24 hours a day, that they are you know, sleeping some of the time. If, if not, then we, we stop doing 24, we do 12 so that they can okay. actually but get the, some rest. But, but they're actually getting paid the 24 hours every hour. Every hour it used right. to be they were there was a flat rate. Then it went to you only had to be paid for the first 16, the eight hours you assumed that you're resting. Right. That went away a year and a half ago. Right. So that's why it just kept going up and up and up. So I wanted to put this there because even if people are paying a caregiver at home, that is the minimum they can pay them to be legal. So, what's the likelihood that within a year or so this is going to get revised so you don't have this? You committed a misdemeanor when you were six years old. What, what, what has happened since they actually started going through everybody? He, they, like I, I had one person in my office that had a, a speeding ticket, 20 miles over the speed limit. It's reckless driving. It was a misdemeanor. I had to go through the exemption process with her because she, we, my, the office people were the first, I mean, they had to do a thorough background check on me. That came back clean within a day, which means I just haven't had enough fun in my life. But everybody in my office had to go through it so early on in the process that they made me go through the exemption. Now they're saying things like that, we're gonna forgive immediately. So they look at it, and before they tell me that person needs exemption, they'll say, we have ex they had an offense that we exempted without even making you go through the process. So they're learning that some things aren't gonna keep these people from being really good at, at, at caregiving. So that was a very good question too. They, they've learned a little bit. But so, I, I handed this out because I wanted you to have it. This kind of explains a lot, a little bit about what the caregivers need to do, a little bit about what I need to do. And I know I'm out of time. She <laughs> knows. <laughs> I know, I know. When he did one minute and I'm still going, I know I'm out of time. <laughs> All right. And Sarah will stay uh, behind for anybody yeah. else who has any questions. Thanks, Sarah. All right, thanks.